good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you confirm that uh, the screen is coming through? We can confirm. Okay. Uh, my name is Jan Willemsen. Uh, in short, uh, I represent one of the three panelists here. I'm the one of the three panelists here, which is not uh, an IT background. And I am going to begin by presenting in roughly 15 minutes on, on more the practical aspects on implementing uh, data-driven KPIs as an organization. Uh, my background is, uh, as it's revealed, maritime, but I have spent the bulk of my career uh, on trade floors. Uh, operating large fleets of ships for large Scandinavian shipping line. Um, I should mention also there that uh, I left uh, the, the shipping industry a couple of years ago and now work with NRM. And uh, my my task at NRM is to develop uh, and define a product offering suitable for commercial shipping, uh, in particular for carriage of goods, uh, rather than the cruise side, which we have been very successful in. And, and doing so also with the, the commercial operator in focus. Uh, I'm going to keep this quite non-technical uh, and, and more uh, advisory. And if there are detailed questions later on, I'm more than happy to, to, to have any of you address me directly. Um, just in short, this is not going to be a sales pitch about NRAM, but I just want to give you a little setting of where we come from. And uh, we have been around for roughly 10 years. Uh, we are one of the leading providers of, of uh, uh, data collection and fuel and energy management. Uh, and uh, we are definitely one of the, due to the size of our installations, with very large amounts of data often collected, one of the largest aggregators of big data where we collect roughly uh, 3 billion data points a day. Uh, we focus mainly on, until today's date, we focus mainly on an actual reduction in fuel and carbon footprint. Uh, as that follows, but um, analysis, the way that it's moving these days, will be so much more incorporating than only the fuel consumption. Uh, we've been uh, recognized uh, quite a bit the, the past few years. Uh, we were very proud to receive the Lloyd's List Intelligence Big Data Award last month, and, and I think that uh, um, shows a lot of the hard work that's been done uh, on the tricky side, which is basically on the data side. Um, but I'm going to go in more in details with that. We're going to talk about uh, data different companies are more profitable. I'm starting to say here, and this is a quote from uh, McKinsey Quarterly. When companies inject data and analytics deep into their operations, they can deliver productivity and profit gains that are 5 to 6% higher than those of the competition. Now, I fully understand this is taking a little bit out of concept, and you ask yourself, how is this defined? You can argue whether or not the number is correct, but I do think that it's a, it's a clear, significant difference in the future between the companies that have managed to, 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 to muscle this, uh, this, this topic down in, and really landed it properly in the organizations to those who have moved on uh, in doing things the old-fashioned way, basically not using big data. And this is not shipping specific. This goes to any organization out there these days. Uh, so this framework of today's, uh, of my presentation, is basically going to be what the title reflects. We're going to talk about the, if the main barriers to successful implementation with big implementing side and why it's often not happening, um, more so actually because we can learn a bit from that. The profitable side, what makes it profitable, how do you actually turn data into something profitable, and, uh, and then we're going to talk about more in details on the KPI side. Uh, how do you make this relevant in a way that it actually becomes useful? So we're we'll starting on the top on the implementing part. And uh, uh, basically, one of the biggest challenges that I want to touch upon first is the way that shipping operations have changed uh, in the past three decades. Uh, the vast majority uh, of shipping today, you have a separation or de-averaging as consultants used to refer to it between commercial operator ship management and the owner and tonnage provider. There's a natural problem here, of course, because the owners and tonnage provider have to pay for any capex investments. Uh, if the charter parties aren't very, very long, like they're on the LNG side, then they functionally come uh, acting like a classic owner operator when you have 25 year charter parties. But for the rest, uh, if the owner invests in equipment on board, the commercial operator who pays the fuel would benefit, and it typically needs to be done by the ship management company. And this is very often. Um, uh, one of the biggest struggles to move ahead and why the industry hasn't really followed a lot of other if you compare to process industry, for example. 
you should also say that the data requirements are different. The different organizations need different types of data. Technical management, for example, often will require high volume data, but it's not time sensitive, whereas the commercial operators uh, are interested in less detail, but need it uh, in real time, so to say, because they need to act upon it. So this then puts the question, where do you lay the responsibility to, 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 to purchase a, a, a data collection system and process uh, throughout your operation? If you lay it on the ship management company, very likely you will get something that is very engine room center uh, and the feeds back into the business might not be there. And vice versa, if you place it on, on the commercial operator, you might not fulfill the technical requirements. So it has to be done in a way if, right, that all, all of the parties involved all get the benefit from the same data so you don't have to duplicate it all. Here is something that I am seeing um, uh, a lot today. Um, what I'm showing here to the left is an old uh, teleprinter. Some of us remember it still. They were relics standing around, but we can say that this basically goes back until the radio was invented about a hundred years ago. Uh, the ships started to, 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 to radio in basically um, where they were. Uh, it was used on telegraphy, but then we moved into to telex, and now we have moved all the way over to we have broadband basically on board. And what the shipping industry, in most cases, have done is that the same process that was developed roughly 100 years ago with the noon report has been retained. Uh, the only difference is we now send it on an email through our, our eight generations of, 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 of communication equipment shift. So instead of asking ourselves, what can we do with this new technology, we tend to ask ourselves, how can we keep doing what we've always done using this new technology? And of course, that is not going to wreak any greater benefit. Um, when I say when meeting with carriers today, I should mention that that part, main part of my job is actually to meet with, with clients and potential clients and basically ask them, uh, what their requirements, what their needs, and what their problems are in the business today. Uh, it is surprising, actually, what they will tell you if you just ask people what they want. Uh, and uh, I will be out two-thirds of the time meeting with chip owners and have, during the past years, done so, meeting with owners and operators of all various types, and uh, try to collect a picture of, of what our next generation of equipment and, and services will look like. Um, the variation in, in where the different shipping line and different operators are and the variation of what they believe that technology represents is actually quite striking. Uh, also within the segment, you may actually meet one uh, operator which you were thinking wasn't going to be having moved forward much at all, and they have moved 10 years ahead of their competitor that you might have met the day before. And the fascinating part about this is that I have come to realization it's not the large companies that we assumed and associated with, with the technology, being technology drivers that often have come the furthest. It is very often the small mass and pops businesses where, which has uh, the interest uh, and capabilities within the small organization to actually move ahead in the shift. Um, a few things that have come up, and this is a couple of almost funny, but, but also very telling examples. Speed optimization was something that we went in to talk to one operator, and, and, and 20 minutes in to the discussion, uh, a quite senior guy for a very large tanker operator told me, well, you can't change the RPM during the voyage. What's the point of this process? Uh, in his world, this was probably true, but of course, it's interesting when you use the word can't, because it's more of a question is what are you willing to, to do uh, in other parts of the business because in his world a vessel just was given an order and sailed that to the end. Uh, it's not worth the efforts to focus on more trust, what I say, as the vessels do what they want anyway. This was actually from literally just a couple of weeks ago and, and was quite striking when I, I was very surprised when I heard it. I think this, this type of perception is often, uh, often retained uh, from the old days when you would have had not so much communication and you would have left a lot to the vessel to decide on their own. Uh, the, 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 the part about it to say though is that this operator will probably have a bit of a challenge when you start linking everything to the shore side that people who are being used to doing things the way that they want to is now going to have to now start communicating the best on that uh, 
uh, with the shore side in a way that they haven't before. And there will be a challenge here, but it can be overcome. And one of the most common things that I hear on the commercial side, and, and, I, and I can see that from having sat uh, with the PNL on a, on a trade floor, when you have uh, many, many of your decisions, if gray is, is, is the, the, what you're seeing at best. But you can argue it both ways. You can either say that it's no point to try to, to structure the data around this bit because it's so complex you will never get it all right. Or you can argue, let's get as much data as you can, and then you calculate it to the bitter end. And then you make a decision based upon the best possible foundation that you have. Um, but nevertheless, I would argue this is a little bit about you either, you either give up or you, or you try to, to move ahead with it. And last but not least, uh, the very, very often communicated one, and this is very, very clearly an example of when you see the de-averaging uh, in the three segments when people say, we do not care about 3% in fuel. Now, I think that's kind of interesting because if you say that on average throughout the industry, often fuel will be a third of your cost. And if the industry average these days roughly returns 4% uh, on EBITDA or 6% somewhere there, you can basically say that 3% that on the fuel representing a third is a full percent down on EBITDA, which on a 4% uh, return margin is a 25% increase of the corporate profit. And, and how then you can have um, uh, people actually still believing that 3% doesn't matter uh, is, is, is really just showing that they, they are focused so much on their responsibilities that they don't really see how it trickles through. There can be a very, very good tool to show the transparency to all the parts of the company to make sure that these, these misperceptions disappear. So based on customer feedback, uh, main barrier in tampering successful implementation of Maven data, data driven system and process are organizational silos lacking links between spending budgets and benefits. We rely on experience and traditions attitude, which basically means that you, you do things the way we have them. Most charter parties and the way we set them up is a very, very old way of structuring the business. And, and we are just as, as, as uh, not likely to move ahead, uh, especially on the technical side, which is a little bit less understood by m many, of, many decision makers. And for various reasons, it's not relevant for us. Uh, this, I find, uh, more so related to, to, to the ones who think that it's not possible. So moving into the next step, what makes it profitable? Well, you can talk about there's two ways you can make money on data. I, I would argue uh, that if you structure them in this way, it's easier to understand, but there are some connections. You either talk about reducing waste, and it's basically um, uh, making sure that, that you, you stop doing what you shouldn't be doing and you do more of what you should be doing. And in that, it basically, there is a data uh, requirement, because visibility is data in most cases. If you do not measure something, you cannot actually uh, say which way you're heading. And you need data to do that. Um, if visibility provides a commercial offer the opportunity to act on basically the visibility you've had, an action may reduce waste. Savings are often unexpectedly large, I say here. Well, I can give you a little background on this. Um, having met with a few large container operators that have all gone down a very similar road of, of implementing a centralized uh, fleet centers, which are manned up and, and monitoring 24-7 what's happening, uh, the numbers uh, in percent that you get from them that they're saying, basically, I think the best quote I got from, from one guy, and excuse my language, he, we just stopped doing stupid shit. And <laughs> it, it's a funny way of putting it, but I, I think it was so well said, because what you realized is, and it was the same thing I realized where, where I came from, once you started to, to monitor what's happening, uh, you immediately realized that a lot of things was going on that you didn't even know you were. You weren't aware they were happening at the frequency that they were. And once you started acting upon it, uh, the amount of, of times those things went wrong reduced drastically. And then visibility creates a common understanding also between organizations or departments. This creates internal efficiencies. And then to the picture here to the right, classic plan do check act 
the planning and the checking requires data, so you know what to plan for and what and, and checking is by definition measurement. Uh, so by moving away from simply just a more unstructured doing and acting, data is required. So to the other side then, uh, where the profits can actually come from, we're talking about optimization. Well, optimization is different from um, waste reduction in the sense that here we are, by measuring things, we're being able to, to offset uh, different cost lifts. On the picture here to the right, for example, uh, very often the offsets between capex, opex, and fuel. Uh, we're going to go in a little more details of that, but data is the basis for optimization. Uh, by feeding it back to, to new commercial decisions, value can be created. Better data will make for better optimization. That is a fact. Better optimization means higher yield. So, to, to explain a li little bit, just high level without geeking in too much, uh, I would argue that if you are moving goods uh, between point A and point B, it doesn't really matter what segment you're in. There are four basic uh, points of, of, of numbers, that sets of numbers that are relevant. You have the voyage related cost, and to the, to the graph here on the left side, you will see speed, and then you will see dollars. And basically what happens here, that you see in the bottom, the voyage cost, which are basically your tugboats and, and your, your, your lighthouse fees and your port costs, is not going to change when you change the speed of the vessel. However, the vessel cost, which is either a charter cost or, or a capex, opex uh, for the vessel, uh, will, will decrease in a, in a slope because it's a kind of a one through x. Uh, the faster you go, you will never hit zero. But the faster you go, the shorter the voyage is, and that basically means that the, you use the vessel for a shorter period of time. And then on top here, you have the fuel cost, uh, which of course will, will increase somewhere around the cube of the speed, roughly depending on the vessel shape and hull and engine configuration and all that. You add those together, there is actually a point for almost all vessels in all settings uh, where your cost base is going to be the lowest. The complexity next then is that you add revenue to this. Um, and then on the right here, you can see that there are two points here then where your profit per day will be, be maximized, which is of course most relevant for a ship owner. And then you will often see that you will have a different speed point, and this is where you can have a certain setup, some, some, some um, you'll be pulling in different directions, uh, a maximized profit for the full voyage. And that's basically going to be driven uh, more and more by, by, by some of the charters vessels in and out, uh, in on time and out of voyage in particular. But, so here it is all about if you have the data to proper assess these in real time, you can basically make sure that every decision that you take at any point is consistent uh, with the direction you want to be pulled. Other examples of this is basically labor cost versus fuel cost, vessel costs versus fuel cost. Freight revenue versus fuel cost. Yes, because the faster vessel, if your vessel proceeds faster, it will move more cargo. It will actually yield more money. So th this is why we're saying here the fuel curve is key because it's going to be one of the the, the most uh, uh, the part in this equation that makes the biggest uh, difference on the curvature. If any of these are seen as linear or static, which in very very many companies it is, there is money on the table. So this is a very, very good example of, of how data in the background can provide higher yields by knowing where you are. So data can provide visibility that can reduce waste. Data can improve optimization leading to increased profit margin. And then the last point here, data-driven KPIs. How do we assure that we capture and process relevant data as sufficient uh, and at sufficient reliability? Well, Unfortunately, a lot of operators I have met with in the past year, they often tell me when you walk through the door, they say, we bought equipment a couple of years ago, uh, we're now collecting massive amounts of data and we don't know what to do with it. Because somebody had assumed at the start we can just use, uh, we have some people back there who are really good at Excel and will we'll now optimize this and they can start breaking it down. It can be helpful to ask a few questions before you start. Why do you want to collect the data? What do we expect to use it for? Who will be using the data? Who will do the work? Because it's actually a little different requirements needed when you're talking about big data analysis compared to, to what traditionally controlling functions often have done. And I would say then often it's good to start with the money because the scope should be limited 
and start with the bottom line is the greatest. Uh, simply put, um, the act of collecting and storing a lot of data will do absolutely nothing for anyone. It's when it's processed, analyzed, and acted upon where the value is added. So very often here, uh, if you've ended up in a situation, I had a good example of that on London Shipping Week. A guy told me he'd just come off a vessel where they had an automated reporting platform which has been reporting 26 values but not speed and distance for five years. So basically he knew about the exhaust gas temperature on cylinder five, but he didn't know what the fuel consumption on the vessel was. Now from a business perspective, what is going to have the largest impact? Uh, by insight and action. Uh, with 50,000 large vessels out, the chances are many questions have been asked before. And what I'm saying with this, in, in this journey of evolving uh, processes and systems internally, uh, Shipping is very rarely unique. There's almost always somebody who has been there before and used the provider to help them before them. Okay. Uh, and then I want to just very quickly say, why does three or even one percent matter? Well, Toyota Prius introduced in 1997 was the first mass produced hybrid vehicle. But it wasn't actually the, the, the hybrid technology in itself. It was a very large number of, of, of engineering initiatives that all collectively uh, created the, the improved uh, efficiency. And that's the same approach that one needs to have uh, on the waste reduction side. It is okay to go chase little pieces here and there because it's all going to add up to a more effective operation at the end. So to wrap that up, KPIs that make a difference, start small and know why. Uh, basically start with the scope that you understand. Very often it's good to start with understanding the performance of the whole ship before one starts breaking down all the little different parts. Start by asking who, why, and what, and then keep that scope limited. And then start where it matters, uh, but which basically means where will you have the biggest dollar effect, but don't stop there. Many small savings will start up, add up to a large one. And I think that is roughly my 50 minutes, and um, I'll leave it off to the next speaker. Great. Thank you very much, Jan. If you have any questions for Jan, um, then please send them to us via the chat feature. Now I would like to hand over to our second speaker, Joseph Carson, Head of Cybersecurity with ESC Global Security. Joseph, over to you. Hi, I'm just checking, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, just can you make me a presenter so I can share the presentation, please? Yes, just one second. Okay. Can you confirm you can see my screen? Fine. We can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joseph Carson. I'm the head of uh, cybersecurity at ESC Global Security, based in Tallinn, Estonia, and I'm here to talk about uh, uh, the enabling big data and uh, what are the cyber threats and uh, cyber resilience. What does it mean uh, for IT security uh, when you start uh, looking at uh, big data? But uh, before I get started, just kind of a recap into what exactly does big data mean? Um, there's actually the, it used to be the four, uh, or sorry, the three V's uh, uh, that defined big data. It was all about the volume, um, the number of the terabytes, uh, the petabytes that you actually gather in regards to those data, how many records and transactions uh, that has been actually uh, uh, created and stored. And then also the velocity that that uh, data has been created is in real time continuous. Does it happen in batches? Is it streamed? Is it periodic? Um, so in, in regards to the velocity. And then we talk about the variety of data, or what uh, types of data you're actually uh, gathering. Is it structured data? Is it unstructured? Has the data been classified from a security standpoint? Who's the data owner? Um, who should have access to that data? And then very much the hybrid models. 
one of the things that uh, has been recently added in, in, in recent times is the veracity of data. And this is really when we talk about cybersecurity or security related to data. Um, this is actually the accuracy of the data itself in regards to has it been compromised? Has it been uh, somebody encrypted it from a ransomware perspective? Uh, where's the facts? Where was it created and was the source uh, uh, authentic? Was it a good known source? How can you rely on the truth of the data itself? And also the reliability. How do you know that you can actually rely on the data to make decisions? So the veracity is the biggest important fact um, or actually a contributor when we talk about the big data in the IT security or cybersecurity terms. Now, when we talk about security in relation to, to big data, we talk about typically the CIA triad. And this is where we talk about things like confidentiality. Who is the person that should have access to the data? Is it encrypted uh, and so forth? Uh, where is it in stored in location? And then we talk about availability, um, about the access and ensure that the people who need to have the data when um, it's needed uh, at critical uh, times. Now, one of the things that's becoming more and more important when we talk about big data, as I mentioned, the veracity, is the integrity of the data. How good is that data? And can you rely on the use of the data? This is an area in cybersecurity which is an up and coming, uh, very fast uh, uh, growth area where a lot of companies are actually now looking at to ensure that the actual integrity of the data is good. Um, some of the technologies that's been used in this specific area is uh, related to things like blockchain technology or industrial blockchain. And this is to ensure that the data integrity is authentic and actually good that can be used. And the blockchain technologies, typically most people refer to it um, or know it as uh, Bitcoin um, or cryptocurrencies, uh, but is an area in, uh, in, in the SCI triad and integrity that has now been heavily used in order to uh, ensure the authenticity and integrity of data. Now, one big thing that we probably should talk about and actually make sure that, you know, it's something of a topic is this year, actually, big data re was removed from the Gartner hype cycle. Um, big data became no longer uh, seen as the hype in IT uh, world. What we're actually moving to is a world of algorithms. And this is probably the most important uh, change or definition um, that has been referred to in recent times. So what it means is, is that no longer it's about collecting and storing data. It's about actually about the algorithms and how to use the data itself to become more intelligent, efficient, smart, and actually create value out of data. And this is where many companies should be spending their time, is not in the big data itself, but in the algorithms that actually create value out of that data. So this is the biggest area that uh, is now in the growth uh, space. And, it's been used, for example, uh, algorithms for creating autonomous vehicles, um, including the autonomous ship. This is where the focus is the algorithms in order to how to use the data. And algorithms will actually define and help you understand which data you need to collect and how to actually uh, uh, data that needs to be actually uh, stored and used in order to create that smart, intelligent uh, decisions that algorithms will help. So we're actually in an age of moving from big data to the algorithms, and you'll see a lot more in the upcoming months and year um, about algorithms and the definition. And IBM is now talking about things like cognitive um, uh, approach um, in the world. Um, so we're actually looking at more of an intelligent type of data approach. So what is the cyber threats when we talk about big data and the move to algorithms? So one is there's a big misinterpretation in, in the world. Um, and specifically in maritime, especially in maritime, where there's perception if I stay hidden or I don't become, you know, I, I, I you know, stay uh, kind of, was it uh, uh, small and don't become a target, then I'm not going to be affected by cybersecurity. Um, that's actually a misperception. Everyone, no matter who you are, is a target. Um, it's a simple uh, statistic that uh, you, um, no matter what size of company, no matter how much uh, revenue or value that you have, everyone is a target from a cybersecurity uh, threat. Um, it also means that uh, you are also potentially, you may not be the target yourself. You may be a secondary victim of a cyber threat. You may be the actual stepping stone to a bigger fish. You may be the actual way or entry point into one of your partners or customers uh, or one of your contracts for those cyber uh, threats to actually uh, gain access. 
So no one is actually uh, immune from this. Everyone is a target, everyone can be affected. Uh, so it's a big perception that we have to ensure that everyone actually uh, takes accountability and responsibility when we talk about the cybersecurity perception. So what does that mean? So this year alone, we've had already more breaches than 2014. Um, so we've had over 500 major data breaches this year alone. Um, that uh, represents over 140 million records. And this uh, uh, data uh, statistic here is actually up until September. So we had 140 million records exposed. If we take the average cost of a particular breach itself, which is somewhere around, uh, there's vari various uh, different uh, uh, data uh, um, kind of, uh, indications of this. And some of them indicate somewhere between $60 to $150. If we take the upper limit, so 140 million records exposed this year actually represents about $23 billion uh, in actually uh, lost revenue in regards to that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, breach cost. So it's a significant uh, amount of actually revenue that's actually uh, resulting in these uh, records being exposed. And 75% of the small organizations were targeted uh, from these threats, typically because their security is actually less uh, um, efficient and actually less um, uh, protected. So therefore, these organizations become an easier target and more compromisable uh, for the threats. And we're also seeing advanced persistent threats on the rise. This is where actually um, the actual uh, attackers or adversaries are actually using more intelligent means, using a lot of things like social media in order to actually gather intelligence about organizations in order to make sure that their actually threats are actually more successful. Um, so this is uh, understanding more about the target and who the right people to actually target in those organizations. Who's the more vulnerable people that will actually allow them to get access more quickly? So that's another area that's on the increase is the advanced persistent threats. So in more time specifically, um, there's a report done recently into what the effectiveness or actually the capability of more time when it comes to cybersecurity is. And the report actually resulted in that the awareness is actually uh, low to non-existent in maritime. So that means that the actual preparation or actually readiness for maritime industry to be uh, prepared or actually respond to a cyber threat is actually uh, pretty much very, very poor. Um, also due to the nature of the high ICT complexity. Um, there's a lot of complex systems, a lot of complex machinery, SCADA systems that are actually very, very old and outdated, um, that are very vulnerable. Uh, which means that uh, it's very difficult for the uh, maritime to actually secure those systems when it comes to cybersecurity. And also the quickly adoption of new technologies as well. A lot of companies are actually quickly adopting latest technologies, but also lacking to understand the, uh, impl imp the implications of those adoption of new technologies. So therefore, the security controls are actually uh, become a second or third uh, uh, consideration when new technology is being ad adopted. And as well as the preparation for cyber uh, attacks, very few organizations that I've worked with in maritime actually have an instant response preparation. They have no readiness in regards to when it comes to when a cyber threat it happens. They have no uh, training, preparation, no policies, no procedures in order hard to deal with those types of attacks. So it becomes very, very uh, uh, a difficult situation when they do uh, occur, and they are occurring very, very frequently. So what are those systems that are under threat? Uh, things like uh, denial of service attacks, where actually services and systems become unavailable. Uh, sensitive uh, customer data and shipment data, they're actually being exposed and leaked, um, so that therefore attackers actually can actually modify um, and change the data and manifests, or actually use it in order to actually uh, target the right uh, uh, shipments in order to actually gain the most uh, uh, kind of criminal activity reward. And also insider attacks and data leaks are also very common uh, in the industry as well. Uh, data leaks in regards to competitive information, uh, intellectual property and ship designs, and actually data about what actually ships are containing and carrying. So therefore, actually, the attackers can actually choose uh, the right uh, uh, containers or uh, uh, other countries can actually uh, reproduce or actually make better offers in regards to competitive information. Insider attacks also related to uh, financial fraud when it comes to actually uh, uh, being able to understand the, the financial systems and detection that's in place, so they can actually easily uh, change and actually extract money very, very easily. Active systems, which are very compromisable. Uh, RF uh, tracking systems and global uh, positioning 
satellites, AAS, and also legacy night data systems. All of these uh, uh, com uh, uh, are basically items that can actually be compromised uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. And also the lack of actually awareness and training when it comes to those people who are operating these systems. Um, these systems have been very, very quickly been brought into service, but at the same time, those who are operating them are not actually uh, trained and skilled into how to deal with them when it comes to cybersecurity, how to ensure that those systems remain secure and safe uh, for the operations uh, to continue uh, efficiently. Those are the main concerns that we have from the cyber threats when it comes to maritime. So who are the risk actors behind this? Well, the predominant one is organized crime. Most of the activity today is actually in, in organized and criminal activities, and that the really target is actually not to be found and to make a lot of uh, uh, money as a result of it. Uh, targeting shipments, um, uh, financial fraud, fish and other activities, um, sending fake invoices, um, sending fake invoices uh, to uh, uh, before the real invoice comes in, into the company, um, things like fuel uh, uh, bills, um, uh, orders and so forth and uh, supply chain. So organized crime are very, very um, uh, at uh, play in this specific area when we, talk, when we talk about maritime industry. Nation states, when it comes down to economic uh, and political power, um, they're looking to actually ensure that their nations are actually more economical competitive in the industry. So therefore, nation states are actually also a large factor behind uh, a lot of the cybersecurity uh, attacks today. Um, more about information gathering, really, than actually uh, manipulation of data. And then terror groups, in order to actually be able to change manifests and actually move uh, uh, toxic chemicals around the, the world, as well as weapons, um, and actually terrorist groups as well, in regards to just changing and uh, manipulating identities. So these are the main risk sectors. There are many more out there that we refer to, but these are the main three that we, re we see more um, impacting and actually effective in the maritime industry. So what is the highest threat to, to your organization? So having gone through all of those items and all of the threats uh, that can impact, um, the biggest threat to all organizations today is humans. We are the main uh, uh, link that actually compromises the systems. In many systems, it actually requires a human to interact or to initiate the actual threat itself. Uh, whether it's through three, uh, phishing scams or whether it's through executing an application or whether it's through uh, going to uh, compromise websites, we are the main uh, uh, element of actually compromising in the actual cybersecurity world. Um, and more predominantly, it's humans that have privileged access. It's, that is the biggest threat in the organization. Once a human uh, has been compromised in regards to the system, um, if, that, if that person or user has a privileged account, it means that the attacker or the adversary has unfederated access to the entire uh, network and can laterally move freedom across all systems as they wish. This is the main concern and something that uh, uh, all organizations, not just in maritime, should actually be focusing on in order to actually protect and eliminate and reduce users with privileged access. We did a study recently into a thousand user organization and the surprise was many people thought that uh, in the thousand user organization that privileged accounts and access was limited to something like 25, 50, 100 people. For a thousand user organization, the surprise would be is that it's actually more closer to 5,000 privileged accounts when you factor in uh, user accounts, um, operation accounts, application accounts, and so forth. That typically um, it's a 5,000 across so uh, a thousand user organization. So very shocking uh, statistics when we talk about privileged access. So the typical stages of advanced persistent threats is that we get reconnaissance, which is the main area that most uh, uh, attackers uh, will actually spend the time in. Then it's gaining access through phishing scams, or actually through malware. Um, then it's pivot building, which is then searching around the network for more uh, interesting targets. And then the main concern is around privilege escalation. Once they get that privilege account, typically means that they actually have unfettered access to all the data um, typically across the network and then they can perform a malicious activity, um, whether it's manipulating data or actually poisoning the data in order to do things like uh, uh, ransomware attacks and crypto locker, or it's actually uh, changing the data in order to do financial gain, and then keeping uh, their threats hidden, which is one of the areas that's uh, uh, of significant uh, concern. So human security risks 
50% of incidents are related by uh, errors by administrators. 70% uh, of the actual uh, scams are actually shared manually. They actually require no coding in order to actually be manipulated or actually moved across or propagated. Humans actually do the more effective job of actually doing this for the actual malware or uh, malicious activity. 23% of people open and click on phishing emails. 50% of people use the same password for internal uh, systems as well as external social sites. So that means that if an external uh, data breach occurs, how many organizations are informing the users in order to actually change uh, their internal passwords when an external factor has been occurred. And again, in 2015, we've already had 500 data breaches and over 140 million records actually uh, leaked. This actually will actually refer to probably around 200 million by the end of 2015. So another area of big concern is when a breach occurs, which typically happens within less than 24 hours of a target. Um, I've seen it as quick as, as, as up to 30 minutes. So if you think about when a breach occurs, which typically uh, uh, could be within 30 minutes to 24 hours, and a secondary victim occurs after typically 48 hours, meaning that already they've attained their second victim. The actual amount of time or dwell time that a, uh, a breach or an anniversary has in the organization is 205 days before they become detected. That means that 205 days to do what they need to be uh, able to actually uh, change, modify, manipulate, do their financial activity, frauds, and so forth, and then um, get out of the organization. So 205 days before, on average, before they're detected. So a big question comes down to, where should we be investing into cyber defense? My and our organization spend most of their time today on prevention. Uh, but in fact, we should be spending more time in the detection area as well. So my recommendation here is to not only spend time doing uh, prevention, but to invest a large portion of your uh, IT budget into detection as well, and then also start preparing for responses. Uh, get your readiness team and incident response team preparing uh, for those uh, when you do have a detection. But you should actually invest more time detection. It's an area that when we talk about big data, we talk about collection and using algorithms, detection is a very important area that we need to actually be um, mediating. And then European Data Protection Law, which is uh, due to come out in 2017. This actually has huge implications for the transportation and maritime industry, where it actually enforces a uh, breach notification um, to the actual law enforcement or local CERT team of the country. So that means within 24 to 48 hours, if you have a, a breach, you have to notify your country's law enforcement agency um, or your uh, country's CERT. Within 14 days, uh, roughly, um, after 14 days, you then have to notify those users or the companies of the actual uh, uh, data um, that has been actually impl uh, implicated in this breach. You have to notify those users are impacted uh, after 14 days. This is a major consequence for many organizations because today many organizations or companies in the maritime are actually unprepared to be able to meet those um, uh, new restrictions that will be introduced with this new European uh, data protection law. This also, uh, if you find that you're in, uh, not in compliance with this law, um, it does mean that you could have potential fines from 2 to 5% of annual turnover, or up to 100 million in penalties if you find that you didn't meet those new uh, uh, regulations, or that you were found that you didn't have appropriate cybersecurity in place to prevent it from happening. And then cyber insurance, right now, there is no cyber insurance in the maritime uh, coverage. Uh, there is cyber insurance for other industries, but right now there's an exclusion. So you have to be prepared in order to start looking at how to ensure that you can actually get cyber insurance or actually cover your risk, whether it being in cyber captives or actually going out and investigating about how to get cyber insurance to cover these scenarios. But right now there's a huge gap and many companies in the actual maritime industry do not have cyber insurance to cover these types of breaches or to mitigate the risk. So the biggest threat and the biggest thing you can do to actually improve your security is employee security awareness training. Some best practices is around uh, IT policy and its acceptable use. Do vulnerability notifications analysis. Ensure you know what assets you have. Minimize your exposure. Only use things that you need. And patch and patch and keep patching. Ensure your systems are up to date. And then continuous assessments. Make sure you're always doing it ongoing. That it's not a checkbox in order to meet a regulation or compliance that you're doing it in order to actually detect breaches. Assume you're already breached. Try to be unpredictable. It's one of the biggest things you can do to, in order to actually capture and detect uh, those uh, who have uh, breached your network. 
and then seek expert advice. So, in summary, cyber threats are real, and cyber uh, uh, maritime is not excluded from these uh, uh, threats. New laws and regulations are coming, and actually will be enforced. They have tougher responsibilities and regulations, and maritime has a major gap in cyber insurance, which you should be looking at in order to actually resolve. So at that point, I'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, afterwards I'll pass it on to the next speaker, and then uh, leave for questions at the end. Great, thank you very much, Joseph. Once again, if you have any questions for Joseph, then please post them to us via the chat feature. Last but not least, I would like to hand over to our next presenter, Peter Davies, Chief Technology Officer with Polestar Space Applications. Peter, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, hopefully you can hear me and hopefully you shortly will be able to see everything on the screen. Isabel, can you confirm? Yes, we can confirm. Super. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody, for your time. And what I want to talk about today is, is a subject called APIs. And somebody reminded me that we should actually not assume that people know what all these wonderful acronyms mean. And so the question was to my staff was, how do I explain APIs to people who probably don't care about APIs in themselves? And the best that we could come up with is that it's really a focused way of people accessing data uh, to a specific set of features and a set, specific set of applications so that you can get access to the data in a controlled and much more easy to program way. And so that's you know, one of the things I think that makes it possible for you know, us to actually take advantage of all the capabilities that big data provides. And where we fit into the scheme of things as Polestar is we've been tracking ships for big customers and for um, commercial operators and for governments for since 1998. And uh, our vision, as you can see here, is we want to be the platform for universal maritime connectivity, and we really want to enable the uh, Internet of Things at sea through a cloud ecosystem. Um, and in the diagram on the top right hand corner you can see that the top side is really what we've traditionally done. We produce a platform which allows people to monitor and manage a variety of things but now what we're saying to people is we know that that's not enough and there will be a variety of third party and in-house developers who want to make use of the data that we provide in order to, to develop their own applications and to really turn that data into to information. Um, and some of this has been covered a little bit by previous speakers. So why do we have big data? Well, we want to integrate new data sources. We want to drive value. We want to be risk responsive. We want to incorporate different kinds of data that's becoming much more important. And one that I'll spend a little bit of time on is, is sanctions data because the, the th threat of sanctions and the problems that that may cause for people in the shipping community is actually quite high. And of course, we want to enable things you know, in future. Um, so what I thought I'd do, though, was give you a couple of examples of things that we can do. And we referred earlier to the fact that we're shifting from data to algorithms. This is a really good example that we did. Uh, those of you who are shipping specialists will understand this is um, the, the, the North Sea and specifically the, uh, um, the, the zones that are, are around um, that, that differentiate the, uh, the, the shipping clusters. When you look at AIS data, this is what you see, um, but it's perfectly possible by using algorithms to then make very clear where the main shipping routes appear. So here you've got the, the channel heading down channel, um, and you can see there that there are two places where uh, the um, activities cluster. And interestingly enough, that is where there is this wonderful roundabout in the sea off Ipswich where a number of different um, tracks come together and where the highest risk is. So this is a fairly simple example of using an algorithm in order to create some sense out of um, 
the, the, the sort of chaos of, of big data that's sitting on, on our platform. Um, one of the reasons we've headed down this route is we know that stakeholders all have very different challenges and very different uses. Uh, we can't possibly meet them all. And so we've kind of applied um, something which Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, you know, enforced with his teams as early as 2002. And, and basically what he said was, is you will use APIs. We don't care what technology is sitting behind them. We don't worry about what they do, but you must be able to design and expose the API, the interface to developers, such that it could also be used in the outside world. So this wasn't just an internal mandate, it was an external mandate as well. And we've kind of adopted that, and now what we're saying is we have an API that is open to the industry, which allows us to integrate a variety of information. And what that will hopefully do is allow both in-house and third party developers to work with big data and create innovative new applications that are easy and fast to develop. Along the way, and we've heard some of this earlier, is security is, is, is a real nightmare and it's something that, that we worry about a lot and spend a lot of time on. Um, we, we spend a lot of time on monitoring and, and QA tools. Um, uh, as was mentioned earlier in the security presentation, not just whether a service is up and running, but actually is it delivering the expected results. Um, we need to be able to deal with the um, problems of uh, you know, uh, different loads on the system. And finally, we also need to provide access to the people who created the API so that people can ask questions as they're busy developing. APIs are a great way for people to create new applications, but there's definitely a hump in the early going where people need to um, access people just to solve specific issues and make things happen. So along the way, we've actually created some brand new architecture architectures um, to enable us to do this. And what's changed, I think, from our old Purple Finder days is we've now built what used to be a monolithic application now is a much smaller set of applications means that they can be updated independently, both the code and the data. It means that we can be much more hardware independent, and therefore people don't need to worry about the complexities of where the data comes from, but they can accept different data from different sources. And finally, although we've deployed to Amazon Web Services as, as our normal mode of operation, we're also sensitive that some people want to be able to uh, go to a private cloud or a short cloud, and some people will want to be able to put some aspects of this uh, on their own systems as well. So we built that kind of flexibility into our architecture. Um, to give you one simple example, but one I think that, that's really good, and the best customer quote we had from this was somebody who's been using this system for about a year, and he said, this system has given me my life back. Um, and the reason that this has become important is because what we do on the surface is very simple. A customer chooses a vessel, they click a button to screen it, and the results come back. Behind the scenes, it's actually a very complex and, and difficult set of queries that are all happening uh, at the same time. We look up the ship details to make sure they're correct. We look up things like port state control. We have a ports database that shows which vessels have been in which ports during the last, uh, it's now up to a year. And we also screen the ship and its associated entities, so owners, managers, technical, people against a variety of sanctions lists. And when we do that, we then deliver back a report which allows people um, to see very quickly whether or not this is somebody that they want to do business with. Um, and it's the power of the API that allows us to deliver that. Um, a couple more simple examples um, of, of how you turn data into information. Here's a ship going into Le Havre, docking in the port, and then leaving again. Um, 
typically if you've seen any of these systems at work, when the vessel docks, because GPS doesn't give you exactly the same positions all the time, you get a whole bunch of chicken scratch. So what we've done on our new system is we've separated those out. And because we know the length of the ship and we know how far it's moved since the last position, we can actually create a much more visually appealing and more useful um, uh, piece of information about what the ship's actually doing. So a moored ship will look very different from a ship that's on the move, and it will become intuitively possible for people. Um, some other examples of smart reporting. I kind of like this slide because of two things. The first is that the gray, dark gray is um, uh, an ECA zone off New Orleans, so it's the North American Environmental Control Area. You can see that this particular ship is reporting very frequently in the darker areas. There's a little pop where it goes outside the, the ECA zone and therefore slows down its level of reporting automatically, and then it goes back in and immediately it picks up and starts reporting at a high level. So all of that is happening automatically. The second thing that's happening is that it tells you whether you're inside or outside the zone what the sulfur levels are and gives a warning as to whether or not um, the, the, the sulfur levels are correct for the zone that it's in. Uh, and this is being done in near real time. We can download this information in five to ten minute intervals so that people on shore can actually take some real action if there's a problem or an issue. Um, and we'd like to think that we could integrate other data types as we move forward in order to give a really simple dashboard picture of things like what the fuel consumption, CO2 emissions, um, environmental calculations, all of that, mixing the data together and then delivering it in a way that actually drives information you know, for, for customers. And I thought I'd leave you with just a little fun example of, of how you can do some cool things with big data. Um, this is actually some shipping patterns speeded up so you can actually get a, a feel for what the shipping routes are. These are eight different vessels running over a period of five years, um, and it does bring the data to life. It's a short and simple example of the kinds of things um, that you could do to allow you to just with simple positional information drive real value you for what you're doing versus what your competitors are doing and, and how it affects things that are going on. I notice we're out of time. I'll stop at that point and just say thank you very much for your time. I look forward to any questions you have. Lovely. Many thanks, Peter. Um, so now that we've heard all the presentations, it's time for your questions. So again, if you have any questions, just type them into the chat feature. Um, so to start off, um, we have a question on regulation, which I know we uh, briefly touched upon earlier um, in Joseph's presentation. Um, but just a general question to um, all the panelists. With information and communication systems evolving rapidly, Will there be a need to update the regulatory framework governing the usage of such systems? Is there anyone that would like to start with this? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment into it's kind of my uh, knowledge and understanding from European regulation. So from the European Commission, um, uh, we've, we've all seen recently with uh, some of the challenges uh, with things like uh, safe harbor. Um, in regards to storing data in the U.S. and uh, has not been kind of given till January in order to find a solution for that. <laughs> so that's a major area right now from a, a data uh, uh, location or data sharing with North America uh, in regards to data center locations. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, changes happening in, in that particular area for Safe Harbor uh, where companies in North America are dealing with European uh, data. And coincide with that, you've got the new general uh, uh, data protection law, uh, a regulation that's been updated in European, the European Commission. And that uh, imposes two major things. One is data privacy, um, and the second part is data protection. And data protection is the specific area um, that uh, impacts critical infrastructure, including maritime. And this would be predominantly across all European uh, uh, Commission uh, member states. All countries have already started uh, putting their uh, 
government uh, institutions up to speed with that particular regulation. And then in 2017, we should see it then uh, be spread across all, uh, all other industries and uh, sectors. Um, and it comes with serious uh, data protection uh, regulations that need to be adhered to. Um, which includes that data breach notification period and also the uh, cooperation with law enforcement. Um, so there is, uh, and that would be a regulation that I'd recommend at least putting the bar or level against. Some countries have done higher uh, levels of regulation against that, um, but I would suggest all companies that are dealing with uh, sensitive data, big data, or any type of algorithms um, that you set the bar to that level because that's the one that will depend on whether you get uh, regulation compliance penalties or not. Great, thank you. Um, so next we have a question for um, Peter, which is what visual visualization packages are you using for the final plot and how is the clustering of tracks achieved from GPS data? Uh, okay, so how's the clustering of data? Um, we actually used an algorithm, and I'm afraid I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it was actually based on some work that NATO researchers did. Uh, was obviously originally designed to try and screen out and to try and build patterns uh, presumably in a security context, um, but, but it actually is very useful just, just to uh, try and look at uh, high and low pattern environments. Uh, I can get the, 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 the details of, of the research paper. It is a published research paper, and we just use the algorithm to do that. Um, the second question was about, so the first part of the question was the, the last slide actually used a, a product called CartoDB um, to do the visualization. Uh, it's quite a nice open source package. Um, and then what we did was we just pulled a set of data, um, a representative set from eight vessels. Uh, and we were doing about four positions a day over about five years just to give a flavor of the sorts of things that one could do. Right. Um, actually, the next question is also for you, Peter, and it is um, how do you represent the rules in your system, for example, the sulfur limits, and are they linked back to the originating legislation? Um, yes, in this particular case, the sulfur limits were established by um, one of our partners. Um, the, the, uh, the, the sulfur limits were set with the customer. Uh, this is a trial vessel, by the way, um, for, for a big shipping customer. And the partner on board actually provided the Sox and Knox gas analyzer that sits on board um, that, that drives all of this. So those limits were set. Um, by by the uh, by the customer themselves in in the uh, system integrator. Uh, so our part of the process was just in terms of delivering um, the information to shore in, in a real time mode and and presenting it in a way that's useful for people. Great, thank you very much. Um, a question for Jan now, um, which is what are the likely cost implications for the data required for um, using such software systems? Or analytics? I think that uh, we can do a comparison similar to what we've seen on the on the um, um, cellular phone side, right? We all remembered how cell phones dropped drastically in price, and and today we're getting used to again paying paying uh, six, seven, eight hundred uh, euro for a phone that we thought would be far far less. But that's collect to the idea that that. Uh, the functionality, and as we grow with it, and as organizations see the value of this, new products will come, and our requirements will increase. So the, I would argue that that communication, electronics, uh, and, and data transmission will go down in cost, but because we are very likely to, to, to start more intensely use big data as a natural part of running our business, we're going to have to start budget more money in that general direction, because we're going to want to do more but the cost of it will go down from a technical perspective. Thank you very much. So we're running a tiny little bit out of time. So um, this is going to be the last question for today. Uh, and it's um, directed to Joseph. Um, are any of the shipping or maritime organizations working on data protection initiatives specific for our industry? Um, 
Well, there is uh, several organizations um, that's working on it. I know that uh, um, uh, PIMCO is also have uh, a number of initiatives that are actually engaging with uh, uh, the specific uh, action in, in uh, cybersecurity for the industry. Um, and uh, uh, also the European Commission as well from establishing its uh, uh, updated uh, uh, reports and actually uh, looking at uh, specific best practices. So there is a, a number of engagements going on. Um, some Most organizations though are doing it on their own initiatives, some of the larger uh, companies that I work directly with, um, though it's uh, not happening at a, a pace that uh, uh, would actually be able to, to um, meet the kind of the timelines is coming with regulations and so forth. So there is a number of uh, companies that's actually engaging a number of uh, uh, and best practices that are both be coming out, uh, but uh, the actual activity and actually participating or actually implementing those changes are actually very slow. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, and I think that's all um, that we have time for today. Um, again, if your question hasn't been addressed now or if you have any other further questions after uh, the webinar. We are more than happy to provide the contact details of our speakers, um, which I now want to thank very much for taking the time out of their busy schedule to present today. And also thank you very much for joining us today, um, all the attendees, and for all your questions as well. Um, if you would like to hear about our upcoming webinars, as well as our events and industry news, please sign up to our newsletter. And once again, thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to you joining us for future webinars. Thank you.